everyone, welcome back to Pages of the Globe, and today I'm going to be reading to you the short story called Yuki Ana by Lafcadio Hearn, otherwise known as Koizumi Yakumo. Now, Lafcadio Hearn was born on June 27, 1850, and died on September 26, 1904. Lafcadio is a Greek-Japanese writer, translator, and teacher who introduced the culture and literature in Japan to the West. His writings offered unprecedented insight into Japanese culture and especially his collections of legends and ghost stories, one of which I will be reading today. Now, Hearn was born on the Greek island of Lefkada, which is why his middle name is Lefkadio. He then moved to Dublin, but unfortunately was abandoned by his mother and father. Then at the age of 19, he went to the United States, where he found work as a newspaper reporter, first in Cincinnati and then in New Orleans. Both times he found really good success, and many people were interested in his writings, as they were very vivid and they had many good descriptions. After that, he stayed in the French West Indies for two years, and then to Japan, where he would remain for the rest of his life. Now, in the late 19th century, Japan was still largely unknown and exotic to other Westerners in the U.S. However, after the introduction of the Japanese aesthetics, particularly at the Paris Exposition Universal in 1900, Japanese styles became fashionable in the Western countries. After that, Hearn became known to the world by his writings concerning Japan. His work is generally regarded as having historical value, but some critics said that Hearn exploited Japan and oftentimes exaggerated its uniqueness. Now, the Lafcadio Hearn Memorial Museum and his old residence in Matsu are still of the two of the city's most popular tourist attractions. In addition, another small museum is dedicated to Hearn in Shizuku, and that opened in 2007, so his legacy does definitely still live on. Now, the Japanese director, Masaki Kobayashi, adapted four Hearn tales into his 1964 film, Kwaidwan. Some of his stories have even been adapted by Ping Chong into his puppet theater, including the 1999 Kwaidwan and the 2002 Oban, Tales of Moonlight and Rain. Now, a fun fact about Hearn was that in a school fight his eye um, was damaged and then it got infected and basically it left his left eye forever discolored. Now this left him super self-conscious about his appearance for the rest of his life causing him to cover his left eye while talking to people and always posing for the camera and a profile so that the left eye was not visible. In fact when I was searching for pictures I could not find a single picture of him with his left eye that was not um, drawn. All of them were with the side profile or he was looking down. Now, in case you're wondering what the story is about, let me tell you. This is a classic Japanese folklore, which is kind of predictable, but it's brilliant. And it's also kind of a classic ghost story that everyone likes. Now, Basically, what happens in this story are that there there's this man, and he has met basically what we would assume as like the death goddess, um, or Yukiona, and she tells him that I'm not gonna kill you because you seem like a young person, but if you tell anyone who I am, then I'm going to have to. Now, this story is like I said again, somewhat predictable. But the morals of the story and how it is written are really good. One of the morals of the story is obviously the sacredness of a promise. A promise is supposed to be unbroken. Neither time nor the conditions and circumstances can break that seal. So you have to keep your promise. We also learn in this story that silence is a treasure. Even if you have attained this kind of Eden-like happiness which the protagonist of this tale has with his unnaturally beautiful wife, no matter what happens, you have to hold your tongue because once your secret is out, you've lost everything. 
Now, obviously, there are other morals that you could pick up from this story, but I would say that these two are the main ones. One thing I do have to say is that this is a beautifully written piece, but it wasn't written in English. It was translated. So if something seems weird to you or doesn't sound right, then it's probably just because it was translated. I did go ahead and edit some of the words to make them sound right because obviously this story was not translated by Ern himself. But yeah, that's just a heads up. Anyway, remember to like, share, subscribe, and enjoy the video! Yuki Ona by Koizumi Yakumo In a village of the Masachi province, there lived two woodcutters, Mosaku and Minokichi. At the time which I am speaking, Mosaku was an old man and Minokichi was his apprentice and was a lad of 18 years. Every day they went together to a forest situated about five miles from their village. On the way to the village, they had to cross a wide river and there was a ferry boat near it. Several times a bridge was built where the ferry was, but the bridge was each time carried away by a flood. No common bridge can resist the current there when the river rises. Masaku and Minokichi were on their way home one very cold evening when a great snowstorm overtook them. They reached the ferry and they found that the boatman had gone away, leaving his boat on the other side of the river. It was no day for swimming and the woodcutters took shelter in the ferryman's hut, thinking themselves lucky to find any shelter at all. There was no brazier in the hut, nor any place in which where to make a fire. It was only a two-man hut with a single door and no window. Masaku and Monokuchi fastened the door and laid down to rest with their straw raincoats over them. At first, they did not feel very cold, and they thought that the storm would soon be over. The old man almost immediately fell asleep, but the boy, Minokichi, lay awake a long time, listening to the awful wind, the continual slashing of the snow against the door. The river roaring, the hut swayed and creaked like a junk at sea. It was a terrible storm, and the air was at every moment becoming colder, and Minokichi shivered under his raincoat. But at last, in spite of the cold, he too fell asleep. He was awakened by a showering of snow in his face. The door of the hut had been forced open, and by the snow light, he saw a woman in the room. A woman all in white. She was bending over Masaku, blowing her breath upon him, and her breath was like a bright white smoke. Almost in the same moment, she turned to Minokichi and stooped over him. He tried to cry out, but found that he could not utter any sound. The white woman bent over him, lower and lower, until her face almost touched him, and he saw that she was very beautiful, though her eyes made him afraid. For a little time, she continued to look at him. Then she smiled and whispered, I had intended to treat you like any other man, but I cannot help feeling some pity for you because you are so young. You're a pretty boy, Minokichi, and I will not hurt you now. But if you ever tell anybody, even your own mother, about what you have seen this night, I shall know it, and I will kill you. Remember what I say. With these words, she turned from him and passed through the doorway. Then he found himself able to move, and he sprang up, looking out. But the woman was nowhere to be seen, and the snow was furiously driving into the hut. Minokichi closed the door and secured it by fixing several billets of wood against it. He wondered if the wind had blown it open. He thought he might only be dreaming, and might have mistaken the gleam of the snow light in the doorway for the figure of a white woman, but he could not be sure. He called to Mosaku, and was frightened because the old man did not answer. He put his hand in the dark, touched Mosaku's face, and found it was ice. Mosaku was stark and dead. By dawn, the storm was over, and when the ferryman returned to his station a little after sunrise, he found Minokichi lying senseless beside the frozen body of Mosaku. Minokichi was promptly cared for and soon came to himself but he remained a long time ill from the effects of the cold of that horrible night. He 
had been greatly frightened also by the old man's death, but he had said nothing about the vision of the woman in white. As soon as he got well again, he returned to his calling, going alone every morning in the forest and coming back at nightfall with his bundles of wood, which his mother helped him to sell. One evening in the winter of the following year, as he was on his way home, he overtook a girl who happened to be traveling by the same road. She was a tall, slim girl, very good looking, and she answered Minokichi's greeting in a voice as pleasant to the ear as the voice of a songbird. He then walked beside her and they began to talk. The girl said her name was Oyuki and that she had lately lost both of her parents and that she was going to Yido, where she used to have some poor relations who might help her find a situation as a servant. Minokiji soon felt charmed by the strange girl and the more he looked at her, the handsomer she appeared. He asked her whether she was yet betrothed and she answered laughingly that she was free. Then, in her turn, she asked Minokichi whether he was married or pledged to marry, and he told her that, although he had only a widowed mother to support, the question of an honorable daughter-in-law had not yet been considered, as he was very young. After these confidences, they walked on for a long time, without speaking. But as the proverb declares, when the wish is there, the eyes can say as much as a mouth. By the time they reached the village, they had become very pleased with each other, and then Minokichi asked Oyuki to rest a while at his house. After some shy hesitation, she went there with him, and his mother-in-law made her welcome and prepared a warm meal for her. Oyuki behaved so nicely that Minokichi's mother immediately took a fancy to her and persuaded her to delay her journey to Yido and the natural end of the matter was that Yuki never went to Yido at all. She remained in the house as an honorable daughter-in-law. Oyuki proved to be a very good daughter-in-law. When Minokichi's mother came to die, some five years later, her last words were words of affection and praise for the wife of her son. And Oyuki bore Minokichi ten children, boys and girls, handsomest children of them all, and very fair of skin. The country folk thought of Oyuki as a wonderful person by nature different from themselves. Most of the peasant women age early, but Oyuki, even after having become the mother of ten children, looked as young and fresh as on the day she had first come to the village. One night, after the children had gone to sleep, Oyuki was sewing by the light of a paper lamp, and Minokichi, watching her, said, to see you sewing there with the light on your face makes me think of a strange thing that happened when I was a lad of 18. I then saw somebody as beautiful and white as you are now. Indeed, she was very much like you. Without lifting her eyes from her work, Oyuki responded, Tell me about her. Where did you see her? Minokichi then told her about the terrible night in the ferryman's hut and all about the white woman that had stooped above him, smiling and whispering about the silent death of old Mosaku. And then he said, Asleep or awake, that was the only time I saw a being as beautiful as you. Of course, she was not a human being, and I was very afraid of her, very much. But she was so white, I... Indeed, I have never been sure whether it was a dream or that I saw the woman of the snow. Oyuki flung down her sewing in a rose and bowed above Minokichi where he sat and shrieked in his face. It was I, Yuki, it was, and I told you then that I would kill you if you ever said one word about it. If it weren't for the children sleeping in the back, I would kill you this moment. And now you better take very, very good care of them, for if they ever have a reason to complain of you, I will treat you as you deserve. Even as she screamed, her voice became thin like a crying of the wind and she melted into a bright white mist that spiraled into the roof beams and shuddered away through the smoke hole, and she was never seen again.